Motion blur in video games is something people either love or they hate. For a number of you, I imagine it's the first thing you may even switch off in the menu of a game after it's loaded up, without even giving it a chance. Now, I think you need to give motion blur a chance, but the decision to wholesale turn it off really makes sense to me. The history of motion blur's origins, the way it is, all have led to a situation where it elicits such a vehement outright rejection. So in this video today, I'm going to talk about the technical makeup of real-time motion blur in video games, what has been done right, and what's been done wrong what could and should be done, and why I love it so much. The goal at the end of this video is to make you, the card-carrying member of Motion Blur is the Devil Club, cross the aisle and partake in the Motion Blur party. And let me tell you, this is one pretty wicked party. To understand Motion Blur's contested existence in video game graphics, we really need to go back to that time, to those early days of real-time 3D graphics, where people got their first taste of Motion Blur, basically. How people experienced Motion Blur for the first time affected how people view it today, I think. And for a lot of people, that time was in the Xbox PS2 generation. The PS2 here especially is the place where a Motion Blur of a particular variety caught on and saw its inclusion into many, hugely popular games. See, due to the unique design of the PS2 hardware, the PS2 was a fill rate monster. While it lacked the cool programmable shaders found in something like the Xbox, with its Nvidia GeForce 3 derivative GPU, its high fill rate meant it could push out many more of its more simply shaded pixels than its Microsoft or Nintendo counterparts. And as long as its 4 megabytes of ED RAM were not filled, it could fill the screen with a lot of transparencies, transparent texture based effects, or alpha blended bits on the screen without the frame rate becoming abysmal, like you see in a lot of modern games for example. So you could see this in games like the Silent Hill series with its use of fog, or for example how the opening sequence of Metal Gear Solid 2 on PS2 runs decidedly better than it does on the Xbox. So with this excess of fill rate in mind, developers ended up taking advantage of it in unique ways. And this is where frame buffer accumulation motion blur comes along. Frame buffer accumulation motion blur is just a really fancy way of saying PS2 motion blur. Yeah, and I think many can just recognize it at first glance from the popular games it was in, like Metal Gear Solid 2 or Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. It's that smeary, framey, ghosty looking blur that affects every single part of the screen. The way it works is really simple actually. In the current frame to be displayed, the sequence of the last frames, let's just say the last four frames here or so, have their opacity progress reduced downward and are overlaid or reprojected into the current frame. In theory, this overlaying of things already rendered, just in a more transparent manner, is a simplification of how real motion blur works and attempts to emulate it, you know, the way it happens in a camera or in your eyes even. Now this is a pretty big point here, so let me highlight it in big bold letters. Graphics that we have in video games, or rasterized graphics, work with discrete points of time. You could have 60 discrete frames in one second, which are drawn from bottom to top with 60 refreshes in one second on many screens. Each of those frames are an incredibly precise snapshot of time, and only when they're played in sequence they give that appearance of motion, but it's just an illusion. This is something that I made mention previously in the tech focus video on anti-aliasing, but even though you can get the appearance of motion from putting these pictures side by side and one after another, the discrete nature of these images themselves, that they're snapshots from a very small finite amount of time makes it so that visible gaps can be seen on elements in those screens, or just in the motion in general. So if an object is moving fast, like this ball here, it could show up just on screen for a few frames, with very little visual clues to its direction or speed. It just appears and disappears. Similarly, if the camera rotates or an object moves and the motion is large, then you can still see gaps in the motion between the frames. Yes! This is a real thing, even at 60, 120, or 240 frames per second on a display that can even display those frame rates. As mentioned in that anti-aliasing video, to prevent this you would need to have a refresh rate and frame rate of a game be equal to or greater than the pixels of motion that an object traveled in. So imagine an object or a pixel that moves 1000 pixels in one second. To get rid of gaps in motion, you need a display and the game to render at 1000 frames per second, if not even more to prevent this problem. And even then, it's hard to say how our eyes and brains would interpret such visual information. Would these thousands of frames per second flashing on a 2D display with its single focus plane produce natural motion blur from our eyes, much like it does in the real world? Eh, it's pretty hard to say, 
But that's the core of the problem, basically. Visual motion on our displays looks imperfect. It looks framey even at high frame rates, and that's just because frames are made from discrete moments of time. So this is where the comparison to cameras in our eyes comes in, and motion blur takes up the mantle to fix this framey gap problem that I just talked about. Unlike video game rendering and fixed refresh displays, cameras are producing images based upon a continuous exposure, whereas a rasterized graphic frame, that is a video graphic frame, is the immediate finite snapshot of some point in time with pinpoint precision, a camera's exposure means it is actually capturing a length of time and condensing that visual information into one static image. Simply put, the longer the exposure of a camera is, the more accurate its lighting can be at the cost of its motion clarity. In a produced image from a camera, in the motion blur you're seeing echoes of light from the entire sequence of time that that image was being exposed and the shutter was open on the camera. The process in our eyes is so much more complex of course, but like a camera, visual information from light that hits our eyes is continuous, and not just an arrangement of discrete images on a screen. And we get motion blur from our eyes too. Just wave your hand back and forth in front of your screen right now. Look! Look at all that motion blur. But getting that effect in rasterized graphics is pretty darn hard. Motion blur works as a fix against this rasterization problem of only showing discrete moments of time in a sequence. Motion blur is an attempt to blend these frames together, to eliminate the strobing effect from a moving object, to give it directionality and speed, or filling the visual gaps of motion where the frame rate is just not high enough. And it will never be high enough. Yep, you heard me there correctly. Motion blur is needed to make motion believable on our screens. So this is exactly what this original accumulation motion blur basically tries to emulate. It takes that exposure over time principle found in cameras and in our eyes and tries to emulate them in in-game graphics. And in a perfect world, it actually does an amazing job of it all. Since it is using real frames that were already rendered, that means it can represent motion blur on every single element on the screen. So geometry would get the motion blur effect, transparencies would get the motion blur effect, and you can even see through the motion blur to see the real background there that is in the present frame. But there's a reason why this motion blur is looked upon in a less than positive way. The real world is imperfect and reality came screaming down. There's a reason of course I've been showing you footage from Quake on the Dark Places engine here. Frame rate is key to making this PS2 motion blur look good. So for an accumulation motion blur to not look framey and ghosty, the amount of motion in an image has to be compensated by the amount of frames in one second. So larger motions need more frames per second to look correct. And for it to start actually looking like a plausible motion blur, the game internally needs to be rendering at hundreds, if not thousands of frames per second to look right. So we basically have the exact same problem we had earlier. We need thousands of frames somehow again. So rendering it in real time either requires a game that is extremely light in performance, so that's why I'm showing Quake here, or some sort of PC won over in a Faustian bargain. PS2 games were of course not running at thousands of frames per second, so this first experience with motion blur in the PS2 generation was really really bad. And I mean really 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 bad. This motion blur in these games like Metal Gear Solid 2 or Grand Theft Auto looks visually intrusive and barely conveys the effect it's supposed to be. It ends up looking distracting in every sense of the word. Instead of aiding the eye and the mind's eye and forgetting that you're looking at artificial images, you're kind of just disoriented. It's pretty telling that modern games implement this type of blur effect to simulate sickness or when your character is about to pass out. I honestly believe this era of blur did a lot to convince people that motion blur is per se bad, a sentiment which holds over to this day due to that awful experience. But that is thankfully just one implementation from a nascent time in 3D graphics. Things got better as programmable pixel shaders were taken advantage of and started getting used in ever more clever ways. And thus we saw the rise of per pixel motion blur and per object motion blurs that we see nowadays in so many games. This started primarily with the PS3 and Xbox 360 era of game engines. The way this works though is rather different than that PS2 styled motion blur we had before. By knowing the direction and speed of a pixel or an opaque geometric object and storing that information between frames, that pixel can be weighted and blurred in a direction based upon the comparison with previous frames. And if you iterate this blur and blending for different slices between this frame and the last, you get that look of motion blur. The obvious advantage here is that you do not need hundreds or thousands of frames for it to start looking like real motion blur. So it's more reasonable in terms of performance, but that does not mean it's not without its own disadvantages by comparison. 
Since it is just blurring and blending in a post-process after rendering is already done basically, it does not have any real knowledge of that information behind the pixel or the object it is blending or blurring. This means that the color and visual information behind an object being motion blurred needs to be faked in some way. And on objects in games, this means you can really have an obvious outline surrounding the motion blurred area sometimes. Similarly, and due to some technicalities, tracking transparent objects and applying this blur to them is not at all trivial. So transparent effects like most particles do not have motion blur applied to them and their movement. But in general, it can look surprisingly like the genuine thing. And when done right, these types of blurs, especially when you focus on the per object variety here, do a great job of cleaning up gaps between frames. They can also serve a great artistic function, adding that extra level of weight and stylistic speed to animation, making it either punchier or smoother. Or they can convey the motion of objects too fast for the human eye to concentrate on, or for high frame rates to even do justice to or can even help convey the incredible sense of acceleration or deceleration as you traverse a game world. Early games to have this effect done in this manner were Perfect Dark Zero and empty framework games such as Lost Planet. But it wasn't cheap, nor was it easy to implement, so its usage was not exactly widespread. So games with both a proper per object motion blur and camera motion blur were actually a rarity. This is where problems start again, as most games from this period mainly just had motion blur on camera movements, not even on all camera movements necessarily. So like the PS2 era of motion blur before it, this is another point in time where motion blur's already tarnished reputation was further besmirched. There are a number of reasons why that is so. Remember how I mentioned earlier that to achieve that motion blur look with this type of effect means iterating on it a number of times, like generating slices of time in between frames? Well, those are called samples, and the number of samples being lower means you can see obvious visual steps in the image, giving everything a graduated stepped appearance when the camera moves. To look convincing in general, the number does not need to be too high for the amount of samples you need, but something like 4 or 5 generally just won't cut it. It was pretty common optimization last gen to reduce the sample count to make the effect run faster, but it also had a knock-on effect of making the blur much more intrusive and visually just not so great looking. Also adding to the intrusive nature of this camera motion blur was the fact that the simulated shutter speed was really high in some cases, so it wasn't just blurring the distance between the gaps from one frame to the next, but going way overboard and kind of over blurring the entire image. This meant that even slight camera movements were greeted with copious amounts of blur. And this is not just from this era of games necessarily, but something that still happens. You only need to look at something like Final Fantasy Type-0. Just look at how brutal this motion blur is when turning the camera, far in excess of the amount of blur needed to cover the distance of the gaps between each frame. You also had the fact that camera motion blur settings and its general existence were presumably designed around gameplay with a gamepad in many cases during this era. This is actually really important. With a gamepad, you have continuous and graduated slow arc movements with the camera. So if you are playing on a PC with the mouse and keyboard, you have comparatively much more erratic, noisy, but precise movement. And with a high sensitivity, a mouse can move a camera 360 degrees in a matter of millimeters. So motion blur designed to be visually obvious with the gamepad, but subtle enough, was then amplified to unbearable levels with the mouse. So in the end, when you combine these factors with the low resolution of games, the sub 30 FPS frame rates that were common, along with overdone bloom and post-processing, you end up having motion blur effects that were super obvious, unconvincing on closer inspection, and were obscuring visual clarity in games that already had trouble with visual clarity. A classic example here I think is the motion blur in Unreal Engine 3, or specifically the original Gears of War. Back in the day it was high tech, but as you turn the camera, you realize how its inner sample count is really low, as well as it kind of turning on full throttle abruptly and turning off abruptly with slightest camera movements. This brings me to the large elephant in the room and something that needs stating, and it's a big part of this video. Most people do not actually dislike motion blur as a whole, I think. I think given the proper arguments made, a lot of people could see the benefits of a properly implemented per object motion blur. So rather, I think when people express a supreme dislike for motion blur, they're actually talking about camera motion blur, due to how it was implemented in games like this, and generally because, ooh, 
it's not actually completely compatible with the way people play games in the first place. In the end, I think it's actually a really reasonable stance to dislike camera motion blur as it has been implemented in games before. And here's why. When playing a game, you tend to focus on distinct regions of a flat 2D panel. And more often than not, that's in the middle of that panel. You can then shift your camera to the center of objects of interest after you find them in your periphery vision. This is especially relevant for mouse users, where you can do it basically with the flick of a wrist. This is also the reason why camera motion blur is not completely compatible with interaction in 3D games. For example, you are playing a game and you just want to turn the camera to look at a character approaching to you from your left or right side. With camera motion blur on, in doing that turning motion, you're obscuring the visual information in front of you in that area where you're focusing on until the movement arc is complete. You lose clarity and the ability to discern what is happening on the screen, where you're focused, by the way, when this is happening. Sure, it may get rid of those gaps between frames and be visually continuous, but it can also be visually distracting, as the world, with its points of reference, distinct colors, and shapes, turns into a homogeneous smear as the camera moves. In cinema and film, you're not interacting with the frame directly, you're not controlling its movement. So it becoming defocused or blurry isn't a huge problem, but in a game where you're trying to traverse a 3D world and find out exactly where you are, this is a pretty big deal. But this does not mean that all camera motion blur is inherently bad though, as this problem really is only relevant for lateral and rotational movements along the X and Y axes. Movements of depth on the Z axis, where your camera pushes forward or backward into the 3D world, do not blur in the area in the middle of the screen where your eyes tend to be focusing. Instead, they tend to just blur along the edges, so camera motion blur along the Z axis here can do a great job of conveying forward and backward movement, but not being distracting as it is only blurring those areas of the screen that are already in your periphery of vision. And conveniently, those are also those areas of the screen that generally happen to have the most need for motion blur in general. So let me sum it up here. Motion blur in general was implemented so ever rather poorly for so long in the history of video game graphics, whether through accumulation or PS2 motion blur, or with artifacty, overbearing camera motion blur in the Xbox 360 and PS3 era. On the other hand, we have per object motion blur, which can add greatly to the smoothness of animations and is not visually distracting as it is not taking up the entirety of the screen. So that is the argument. Not all motion blur is bad, you don't need to always turn it off. But for that to be the case more often, some things need to change and become more widespread. So this is where I think developers can step in and help the motion blur cause. With an extra two or three options in games, my argument here will be strengthened. But for that to be the case, I think devs need to first implement an option slider controlling the shutter speed or strength of motion blur, which is independent of frame rate. This is done already in games like the original Crisis, or with selectable presets like in Doom 2016. So while I may like a long shutter speed with per optic motion blur at high frame rates, others will not, and they should be able to control motion blur strength to match their preferences. I also think developers need to separate camera motion blur from per object motion blur, both how it is done and the way you control it. As I have talked about, camera motion blur has some questionable value for video games, so being able to control its strength, or the strength of various directions of it, or disable it altogether while leaving per object blur on is something that should be more common. And it's not exactly impossible, and I know that. By tweaking some values in Prey 2017 outside of the menu, it's actually possible to lessen or completely disable the camel motion blur while keeping per object blur on, and I think that's completely awesome. So what do you think? Have I convinced you that motion blur is an all too often misunderstood effect that actually has its place in video game rendering? And if not all types, are you perhaps more convinced that per object motion blur is actually pretty great? I hope so, but let me know what you think below in the comments. In general though, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Hopefully now that I've compacted my love letter to motion blur in one full video, I can finally stop gushing about it so often in others. If you did like the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, please consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be notified about Digital Foundry videos as soon as they're posted, as really every little bit helps. If you want to talk to me about how amazing per object motion blur is and how it makes everything in life better, please get in touch with me or Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.